everybody. Welcome to another live stream Pitcher Guy podcast. Today I'm joined by Caleb Jackson. And today we're going to be discussing why we do not buy into mythicism, the idea that Jesus never existed. We're going to be discussing um, some of the uh, evidence, or actually a bit of the evidence that, they're, uh, that they go through to look at, like uh, Paul, Josephus, different interpretations of Paul. Um, why they, you know, they, they suggest that Paul... Paul's Jesus died in heaven somewhere, um, but Paul elsewhere suggests that Jesus was born under the law. So we're going to be discussing things like that and take it from there. So welcome to History Valley, Caleb. Thanks you for having me, Jacob. Glad to be on here. Of course. So Caleb, I want to start with you. Um, when you became familiar with mythicism, what was your reaction? Um, what do you think of their interpretation of Paul? And we'll just go from there. Yeah, so when I had first heard of mythicism, it was an idea that I wasn't even really aware of people had at the time. I had just heard, oh, yeah, everyone agrees there's a historical Jesus. Um, but I think a lot of people's first exposure to it was more on the pop level. So with stuff like Zeitgeist, you know, when you have these parallels with um, oh, Horus was crucified and rose three days later and all this, which even the more scholarly mythicists reject because it's, it's considered a fringe. Uh, I think certain people would call it crank. But uh, so that's not the mythicism that I think we're here to uh, to critique today, because that's not one that's taken seriously by virtually any scholar. Um, but yeah, so mythicism is the idea that the historical Jesus as a person did not exist. So this does not mean that um, people don't think that people just thought that there was a historical Jesus, but that he just didn't perform miracles and wasn't God. But he may have been a Jewish teacher. That's the, the mainstream view. But this is the more radical view that there was no person that ever started the religion to begin with. And this was more of a gradual um, religion that existed for centuries that evolved into this idea of Jesus being historicized, similar to, to Hercules or to Osiris or to Romulus and other figures who are generally considered to be fictional. And so the mythicists are trying to argue that uh, this is how Christianity started and that our earliest sources, which are the epistles of Paul, don't ever actually mention a historical Jesus. They mention a celestial Jesus in the sky as a deity or at least as an angel, depending on which view you take, and that this was later right. developed into the Gospels decades later, and uh, the Gospel of Mark was originally a myth, and this became Matthew and Luke who used Mark misunderstood this, and they thought it was history, and so they made it into history, and so you get this idea of the celestial Jesus being forgotten and beaten out by the camp that believed in the historical Jesus decades later. So that's the general outline of the uh, most commonly cited scholarly views of mythicism, um, which are still considered to be in the vast minority of scholars and are still fringe as of now. So, you know, when I look at their interpretation of Paul and they argue, well, if you look at Paul, he doesn't really place Jesus's death on earth. And I, and I just have a hard time understanding why they think that. Um, because like Paul in Galatians says, Jesus was born under the law. And, um, he was born of a woman and in Philippians, he, he became a man. Now they'll, now they'll say, well, those are strange things to say. Why would someone put it in that way? Like th to them, it's just the way Paul says it to them. I think some of them think that it just makes them think it just sounds fake, but nevertheless, Paul is giving a basic rundown as to um, why he, he thinks Jesus uh, was an earthly figure. He's trying to, uh, tell the Galatians and the Galatians, the argument that he has with the Galatians and Galatians three to six is, it's actually very interesting to me because given uh, Paul's anger towards them and the fact that he says in the beginning of Galatians three, that Jesus was portrayed as crucified among you suggests that he is arguing with people that appear to reject the crucifixion. Um, and he's saying that that's that it's ridiculous to him, and he's trying to tell them, look, he really was crucified. And these are probably the people that were non-Christians that Paul is arguing with, people that knew nothing about Jesus, and and uh, or they did know something about Jesus, but they did not agree with him. There's different ways, I guess, one could look at it. It's a, but it's but it's it, it is a strange argument. Um, and then they'll go to something like uh, First and Second Corinthians to talk about. Uh, those two letters talk about Satan and his and his demons or archons crucifying Jesus, but the archons were heavenly. Were, um, they were earthly rulers obeying um, 
uh, demonic powers in the heavens, something like that. That's kind of the way it's put in those letters. And the, the thing is, from my interpretation, it looks like you still have Jesus dying on earth anyway, even with that, because those, those archons, the Greek word for ruler, is still being influenced by uh, being controlled by demonic powers, being told what to do. What do you think about that, Caleb? Yeah, I think it's a combination. So, I mean, if you read, for example, the way the Gospels have it, it's the Jewish leaders, the Roman leaders, and you have Judas, yeah. who is possessed by Satan, right, is how I think Luke tries to say it. So I think the early Christians did think that Satan played a role in the death of Jesus, but I don't think that it removes the responsibility from the humans, and that's the part that uh, mythicists would try to, to deny. So Paul does use the for, uh, the phrase archons of this ion, the rulers of this age elsewhere. For example, I think Romans, is it 13, where he's talking about obey your rulers, who you know pay your taxes he's yeah. clearly talking about earthly rulers in that context um, yeah. in terms of that submitting to that so paul clearly could mean that and you also have passages like first thessalonians 2 for uh, uh 13 to 14 is that it i think 14 to, to 16 sorry um which most mythicists will say is an interpolation because that verse talks about uh how the jews were, were the ones who killed the lord and how god's wrath has come upon them and so mythicists and not just mythicists there are some scholars who have argued in the past especially back in, back in the 1970s and so that this is an interpolation that um paul never said that because it's anti-semitic paul would never refer to the jews as if he wasn't one of them because he was a pharisee um first of all that's not necessarily true because paul does use the term uh, the jews in a, in a kind of derogatory term i believe in second corinthians when he says like i received 40 lashes from the jews um and elsewhere we also don't have any manuscript evidence that uh this is interpretation. The earliest ones we have all have this verse. Now they might say, "Well, it could have been interpolated before that," um, but that's why scholars like Bart Ehrman and others haven't been convinced of that. And this is still considered to be a fairly minority view. Now, granted, it's not a view that only mythicists will argue for, but um, there are certain papers. For example, uh, Nicholas Taylor in his paper "Who Persecuted the Thessalonian Christians," um, which was published back in 2002, it's about 20 years ago. But this is still later than most of the arguments for interpolation. Uh, argues on uh, where is this? Uh, pages 785 to 789 that, quote, the hypotheses for interpolation have not found significant support in scholarship. The arguments for an interpolation in 1 Thessalonians 2, 13 to 16 are unconvincing, and recent scholarship has tended to accept its authenticity. And so there's lots of reasons that we could go into for that, but essentially the anti-Semitism arguments don't really hold. The idea that God, Paul would, you know, blame Israel and talk about Israel's being condemned and God's wrath having come upon them might seem out of character for Paul, but if we go read places like Romans 9 to 11, Paul seems very harsh towards Israel, where he's mm -hmm. condemning them. But there's, he says, yes, he says all these bad things about Israel, but in the later passages, Romans 11, Romans 12, Israel will be redeemed, right? So it's hard to just say, like, Paul believed this, because Paul's a very complicated person. So on the one hand, you'll have patches where Paul is condemning Israel and talking very badly about how the Jews rejected Jesus. But then he talks about how, oh, well, but out of all of this, Israel will still be saved and the gospel will still go to the Gentiles and, and the Jews still have a chance to repent. So you, Paul is not just a black and white character. He's very gray. And so I think when we take all into that account, oh, and I think the last thing that they complain is that um, when it says God's wrath has come upon them, a lot of people think that means the temple being destroyed in 70, which would mean that uh, you know, since first, Thess first Thessalonians was written in the 50s, this would have to be a later interpolation. But many scholars have said that doesn't have to refer to the temple. It could refer to the famine that Josephus and Acts talk about that happened in Israel um, that, that devastated them. And that, that could be God's wrath. And it could be any number of things. So, yeah, I don't think the arguments for interpolation in that uh, particular ones are very persuasive. So that, that that's, I think, one of the strongest pieces from Paul that you could use if you thought that passage was authentic, that the Jews were the ones, along with the Romans, uh, who took place in uh, executing Jesus in that way. And so that would put Jesus on earth rather than in heaven, or at least be better evidenced for that. So that's one part of the, the Pauline corpus you could argue for. When when we get to the Gospels, does it seem like to you, because it seems like this to me, that they're trying to combine the different, the different ways uh, Jesus' death is described in Paul. Now, Jesus' death is always him being crucified, basically. Uh, but um, in 1 Thessalonians, it, it, it seems to at least imply the Jews murdered Jesus. And then in uh, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, it's demons that worked with, ar uh, with earthly archons to have Jesus killed. Um, so when it's, when it's saying something like Satan 
was behind the crucifixion of Jesus. He was behind the Jews telling Pilate to, to kill Jesus uh, in the Gospels. Do you think it's kind of like combining the different views? That yeah, Paul. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that it's. I think that there probably was some coercion between the Jewish leaders, like the Pharisees, mm -hmm. and the Roman official. The Romans were the ones who officially crucified Jesus, but I think there was some kind of cooperation in terms of them delivering him. You do see this, for mm -hmm. example, with like um, Josephus talks about uh, Jesus ben Ananias, and he yeah. he talked about the temple will be destroyed. This is like I think in the early sixties AD. Right. The, the Romans will destroy, or maybe the mid sixties. Romans will destroy the temple, and so the Jews complain, and they and they go to the Romans, and he gets flogged. Um, doesn't get executed, but gets flogged. And so you do, and I think you see this elsewhere with, before the temple fell, when you have uh, a certain man improperly sacrificing birds in the temple, and they go to and they complain to, um, I think it's Florus, uh, the the Roman governor at the time. And they complain and they want him to stop it. But the point is that this is there is a, there are examples of the of the Jewish leaders of the temple going to the governor and complaining this person's a nuisance, do something about it. And sometimes they do it. Now, of course, they didn't care about the, their laws being broken. The Romans cared about having stability, and so they probably would have told them that Jesus claimed to be king of the Jews, that he was a seditionist, that he might not be loyal to Caesar, and those would be things that Pilate would have been concerned about. So I do think there was some cooperation. I do think Paul kind of implies all of those. So yes. You do see in the Gospels Satan playing a role, according to the Gospel authors. You do see the Jewish leaders playing a role, and you do see the Romans being the ones to actually carry that out. And so I think that's um, that's really interesting and kind of has all of those in different places. But I don't think it's inconsistent with what the Gospels portray as the general picture of what was thought. Just real quick, I want to go, I want to go back to Galatians chapter 3 when Paul tells the Galatians that um, we, we asked them what— uh, and he doesn't ask them. He says, "What well, uh, uh, that they've been bewitched, and Jesus was portrayed as crucified among you." How do you look at that? Is he is he responding to the view that um, that he wasn't crucified, or is or that they don't know about Jesus? What do you think about that? I didn't really state my position earlier, but I just wanted to, to see what you thought of it first. What, okay, sorry, I'm just like, okay, so this is Galatians 1. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Yes. Let me ask you this. Did you only receive? Okay, so you're saying that like, Paul is clearly saying you know about the crucifixion. This isn't just like, um, this is like public knowledge. This isn't just a private re revelatory kind of thing, right? This would have been something right. kind of well known. Yeah, I think that sounds right. And I think that the, the Galatians were debating it because... Uh, I think it's in Romans 1 where Paul says that the uh, crucifixion was a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness okay. to the Gentiles. I think that's what Paul is kind of trying to counter here because the idea of Jesus being crucified, it's like, oh, that's, you know, that's ridiculous. Now, they do have, there were there were concepts of gods who were executed and so forth, but that's not directly analogous to what Paul is trying to say here in terms of, um, oh, a human was the one to do it, right? And that kind of, and that, I think that kind of establishes something as well. If Jesus is just another, another one of these dying and rising gods, then what does Paul mean by the crucifixion was foolishness to them? It's like, well, I thought you said the Gentiles had lots of dying and rising gods. Why would why would a, a crucified God be any problem for for these Gentiles? I mean, they had lots of them. No, it was because this was a, in their mind, a cult leader, a, a person who had a movement who was defeated, and yet was still seen as a king. It's like, well, obviously his movement failed, and yet you all continue to worship him. I think that's what Paul is responding to, both in Romans one and Galatians one, uh, Galatians three, in that context. So, yeah. So let's get to uh, let's get to Josephus for a moment, and I also want to bring up Tacitus too, because those, as we, as you know, they both are brought up very often in the discussion. Um, they usually argue that both of them were uh, interpolated. And Christian scribes had modified both and pretty much added Jesus to the text later. And even if they both mentioned Jesus, they could have just gotten this from the New Testament or other Christians talking about Jesus. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, hold on. I'm trying to pull up the actual testimony and just so I can sure. make sure I yeah. get the exact words. Okay. Um, let's see. That's So I'll do that. James Dunn's interpretation. Now the testimony is kind of complicated because uh, there's a lot of back and forth in terms of uh, when it was written. And so like, there's the idea of like, oh, well, this isn't mentioned until I think I want to say it's Eusebius. I could be wrong on that in terms of who mentions it first. And so this is uh, partial evidence that this was uh, written later. It wasn't originally part of Josephus's uh, initial writing. 
And so uh, you have this this really flaviant, really um, uh, fawning passage about Jesus from Josephus, who's a Jew, and did not think Jesus was the Christ. He thought uh, some of the Roman emperors may have been. But what, what the testimonium says is, quote, about this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed he ought to be called a man. For he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people as to accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Christ. And when upon the accusation of principal men among us, Pilate condemned him to the cross, those who had first come to love him did not cease. He appeared to them, spending a third day restored to life, for the prophets of God had foretold these things and a thousand other moths about him. And the tribe of Christians, so called after him, has still not disappeared to this day. Now, of course, there is reason to be suspicious of this passage because Jesus, uh, you know, Josephus would not have said, if Jesus be called a man or he was the Christ and all of this stuff, because a Jew wouldn't say that and still be a Jew and not a Christian or talk about the resurrection, for example. So uh, virtually everyone agrees that this passage has been tampered with. The question is how much was this mm -hmm. something that was completely invented by later Christian church fathers, or was this a passage that Josephus really did write, but that it was just touched up where there was a few, Oh, let's add in if he be called a man, right? And so these are the two camps. And the predominant view and the, the majority view does seem to be the idea that it's partially authentic, that Josephus does mention Jesus to a certain degree, but that it's not to the extent. And that part of that's because there's an Arabic text that was, I'm sorry, not to, I, I, I believe it's, uh, is, is that right? Is it in Arabic? Agapius. Agapius, yeah. Mm -hmm. Text that was found that has a, a different version of it. Now, I know that certain people will say that, like, there was a 2014 study that, argues that that was ripped off of um, the the original, the, the Eusebian text. But I don't, I think the authors actually argue that that tries to prove that it's the original was authentic. It's very complicated and kind of hard to break down. But, but even going off of that, I think there's indications um, that one could do it. So James Dunn, for example, has his version where it's, um, this is, the, he, this is how he reconstructs it. Um, now there was a, at that time, there was a, a Jesus, a wise man, for he was doer of startling deeds, a teacher of such men as to receive uh, the truth with pleasure and he gained a following both among many jews and many greeks of origin and when pilate at the suggestion of principal women among us condemned him the cross those who loved him at first did not forsake him and the tribe of christians so named after him did not go extinct until this day so here in this construction it still mentions jesus but it doesn't mention him being the messiah doesn't mention him being the christ doesn't mention the resurrection and and, and lays back on how much you know josephus is praising jesus mm -hmm. It's a much more realistic view in that way. And there's a couple indications that this probably was at least partially from Josephus. Um, there's a combination of Joseph and back vocabulary that Joseph uses, this Josephus uses elsewhere. Now, uh, there yeah. have been studies that say that you, uh, there's parts of uh, vocabulary that are from Eusebius as well, or I think it's Eusebius. And so I think the natural explanation to that is it's a combination of the two. You have some Josephus, some interpolators, and that's why there's a combination of both, which if this was just a Christian invention, you wouldn't expect to be very much Josephian vocabulary at all. But vocabulary arguments are always very tricky. I think the better ones are the idea that, because some people will say, well, even if Josephus wrote this, he's just getting his information from Christians. But there's a couple of things in here that kind of go against what the gospels say, or at least don't have what you'd expect apologetically. So it says, like, for example, Jesus spread his gospel to the Jews and many of the Greeks. Well, the gospels, Jesus almost doesn't interact with the Greeks at all. I mean, there's, I think, at one point, like a Sinophoenician woman, but Jesus almost exclusively stays in Israel. It's not until after the, the death and resurrection of Jesus, when the disciples are told to go out, out of Jerusalem, that the gospel spread to the Gentiles. In fact, even then, Paul's really the first one to do that. They didn't even want to go past that and they had issues with um spreading the gospel to, to the gentiles and so for Josephus to say that jesus talked to the greeks and gent and, and and the jews is very strange and doesn't seem like this is something he heard by reading the gospels or listening to to christian oral traditions this makes more sense if josephus is looking back and seeing all of these greek christians and assuming that well jesus must have had a greek influence because clearly he the greeks seem to like him um, another thing is that he really he blames Pilate for for the death of Jesus and not the Jews, which is kind of indicative that this is this makes sense coming from Josephus because Josephus was Jewish. And so, of course, he's giving it more to Pilate, whereas a lot of the Christians later in the traditions <clears throat> became more anti-Semitic and blamed the Jews almost exclusively for the death of Jesus. So if this is a later Christian interpolation, it's surprising that he's still giving uh, he's still attributing it to Pilate. Whereas if Josephus writes this, it makes perfect sense as to why he's blaming Pilate. And in the context of the passage, Josephus is talking about Pilate in a broader context and all of the atrocities Pilate did. And this passage about Jesus kind of thrown in there. Now it seems a little out of place when you read it in context. It's like, okay, he's talking about the misdeeds of Pilate and he's giving another example of, okay, here's a, a Jewish teacher who Pilate killed and what a shame that was.
So that's kind of a very brief lay overview of um, the arguments for the testimonium being partially authentic and not necessarily being dependent solely on Christians. So, um, yeah. In fact, I, I have the, uh, let me just get this one second. Yeah, James Charles Worth's uh, book, Jesus Within Judaism. Uh, he has the Arabic uh, testimonium somewhere here, the uh, the gay pieces testimonium. Just got to find it for a second. If I can find it. Um, here, here we are. Similarly, Josephus the Hebrew, for he says in the treatises that he has written on the governance of the Jews, at this time there was a wise man who was called Jesus. His conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. Virtuous, excuse me. And many people from among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. But those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion, and that he was alive. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah, concerning whom the prophets had recounted wonders. So it, it is interesting to me how different, uh, it's similar, but also how different it is from the one that we get in the manuscripts, the complete manuscripts. Right. And the mention of Jesus being righteous kind of goes with the idea of, oh, he was a righteous guy and Pilate killed him, kind of maybe unjust. Right. Yeah. And that's why and that's why that's a bad thing. And then he just moves on. So not not too much of a reference there. And of course, there's another Josephus Patrick that's even less controversial that most scholars. Now, there are some who, who dissent, but traditionally most of them accept as authentic. And that's the James passage. Yeah. Which actually, I think kind of harkles back to the testimony in terms of it might refer to that again in terms of he, he just mentions Jesus and assumes you know what he's talking about because of the testimonium. Right. But in that passage, it talks about how James, uh, and it says that the brother of uh, the brother of Jesus who, who is called the Christ um, was brought before the um, high priest and was executed for, for political reasons. And so um, right. the idea that it has the, the, the phrase who is called the, the brother of Jesus who is called the Christ um, that that's typically the part most most mythicists don't argue the entire passage is interpolated they'll say just the part of what's called the christ was added in by a later scribe um because of this and so originally it's referring to jesus as the the brother of the high priest or, or something jesus uh, right. uh yeah yeah jesus son of damnius yes you know. jesus damnius yes thank you and i think that it's it seems weird because if you look at the testimony and when they have the part about the christ it says he was the christ it doesn't say he was called the christ right and that's why it's so suspicious because it's like Josephus wouldn't say he was the Christ. And so when we see the phrase, he was the, who was called the Christ, not he was the Christ, but was called it. That makes sense for Josephus to say that he's like, oh yeah, people thought Jesus was the Christ, but he's implying this is what they said, not what he actually personally thinks. So that makes sense from that. But if a Christian was trying to interpolate this, I would expect them to, to say Jesus was the Christ, that he was the Lord. And so I think it makes more sense if Josephus initially wrote this. Now there is the term was uh, the brother of Jesus and, and called the Christ in the gospels. But usually when it's being said, it's by being said by people who, people who aren't Christians like Pilate or by people who are watching Jesus from afar, but usually not by people who are already Christians. Um, usually it's the term like brother of the Lord or brother of, of something like that. So I think there's not, I don't think the arguments are very strong for thinking that's an interpolation. And that's why most scholars tend to think that's, that is uh, legitimate. And of course, it's not something that's found in any of the Gospels. And so it doesn't seem to be dependent on any kind of tradition from, from the New Testament that we know of. Um, Hegesi, uh, I think, is it Hegesippus or Hegesippus? I forget how you pronounce that. Mentioned Hegesippus. Um, Hegesippus, yeah. He mentioned the death of G James, which is probably a bit more exaggerated than what Josephus says. Um, but I think that's the only other Christian source that's like relatively close. So yeah, I don't think the reasons for that. Now I know that people like Richard Carey have a. I think he's a he has a published article on this, where he basically says that it's it's a scribal error and that um, I forget if it's Yose Eusebius or Origen. Someone quotes the passage and they say Josephus says this, and then he attributes yes, it was Oregon of Alexandria. Oregon, uh, thank you. And he says, oh, Oregon says that um, Josephus says James died, and then he says, and then he blames this on and this, and then he blames this on why the temple was destroyed. 
which are seen right. as never blame it on why the temple was destroyed. And so Carrier thinks that Origin is mi Organ is mixing up uh, Josephus with Hegesippus, that he's getting right. uh, Hegesippus. He's getting the authors mixed up. And so when he says this, then a later scribe comes and reads this. And he's like, oh, and they look at the passage and they put, oh, he must be referring to Jesus of Nazareth. And so they put, was called the Christ and in, in, to the initial passage. And so it's this kind of complex idea of interpolation. Um, but when you read Oregon, I mean, the church fathers all the time theologize text, just read any of their commentaries. They will put their own thoughts into it and say, this is what the author meant when the author didn't literally write that. They're they're putting their own interpretation. So when Oregon is saying, yeah. and, jo and Josephus interprets this to the fall of Jerusalem, like, of course, Josephus doesn't think that, doesn't actually say that. But Oregon is putting his theology on it and putting it onto the lips of Josephus. And that's not uncommon with Oregon or with, especially the Alexandrian school, if you look at Philo and, and some others. It's pretty common to do this. Um, to where it says, like, I remember in one passage where he talks about how, uh, when the Thomas touching Jesus and John, where he's like, uh, Thomas, uh, heard the women say this, but he did not believe unless he were to see this. For it was not unusual for man to be seen, uh, but to be touched. And he adds all this stuff, and it's like, well, it never says that in the text, or again, like, this is you, you interpreting as to why Thomas didn't do all this and, and, and do that. So, you know, it's not uncommon for them to put their own thoughts kind of onto the text. So, I don't think we have to explain that by appealing to. Well, he got two texts mixed up, and then this him saying that these were mixed up is what made a scribe notice this, and then he put a scribal error, uh, scribal note into it, and then later copyists made uh, saw the scribal note and then added that into it, and it seems like a kind of a complicated hypothesis, especially when you add on the part about he was called the Christ instead of he was the Christ, and so I just yeah I don't I don't think the evidence for that is very strong at all. I tend to agree. It's a it's a lot of explanations that are unnecessary um the parsimonious argument is uh usually um usually people will say the parsimonious argument is the more likely is most likely the truth the simpler argument and that is like because it looks like here we have multiple stages of interpolations yeah and that, hundreds of years and that's kind of what's what's i think a big critique of mythicism and it requires a lot of auxiliary hypotheses and if any one of those is is incorrect then it reduces the probability of mythicism by quite a bit so if everything mythicism were were fair evidence but first thessalonians 2 14 to 16 is uh is accurate is not interpolation that really hurts the probability of mythicism if um either the josephan passages are correct um depending on how how dependent you think they are on the gospels Everything else can be there, and yet that that one piece alone would really hurt your 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 data. Um, even something like the um, the uh, church fathers, like we have uh, traditions to where, like for example, um, uh, Irenaeus, writing in the se mid second century, says that he personally knew and met Polycarp, and that Polycarp got his teachings from John the Apostle. Now, Irenaeus could be lying; he could be misremembering. I'm not saying we should trust him everything, but. I think there's a fair probability like that he might be right. Like it's nothing wholly implausible that could be the case. And if that's the case, I think that would really be bad for mythicism because you're saying that within, you know, if John thought Jesus was a celestial being from heaven was having these visions and passed it on to Polycarp, you have like already just within two generations, a complete development of legend to where like they couldn't even, you know, Irenaeus completely misunderstood and thought it was historical when it wasn't. And I, that just seems implausible. So I'm not saying that, that we know that that's true and, People could debate about that, but the point is, like, it's not like uh, we don't have really, really strong evidence that that isn't the case, and so it could go either way, and so that's at least something you have to factor in as saying it's plausible in that way. So I think there's a lot of pieces for evidence. Um, speaking of that, if you want to go back to Paul for a second while we're talking about the James passage, we want to talk about the brother of the Lord. I think that's what even most mythicists would say is the strongest piece of evidence in Paul, at least, um, for the historical Jesus, um, because in, you have. Uh, a couple different passages. One of them is, I think, in Corinthians, and one of them is in Galatians uh, 1, and I think in one of the other passages, where Paul meet, says that he went to Jerusalem and he met Peter. Uh, he met, he met, no, he didn't meet any of the apostles except for Peter, who, uh, and, and then he says, and James, who was the Lord's brother, right? And so, mythicists usually interpret this as saying, this is a cultic brother. This is like, he is my brother in Christ. And, and Paul does use that phrase elsewhere in terms of brothers. Just read Romans 16. He does use that a lot. Or, or 1 Corinthians 15 where he says brethren. So he does he does use that phrase a lot for sure. But I think the idea is that he's distinguishing here between Peter and James. He doesn't say that both of them were brothers. He doesn't say that Peter was a brother. He says Peter and James, who was the Lord's brother. And so 
the natural reading of this, at least to most people, is that James is the actual biological brother of Jesus. Now, people like Carrie will cite uh, articles by Trudy Gurn and stuff that try to reinterpret the Greek and say that it's mistranslated, and there's a whole kind of complicated argument with that. But the, the main point that they try to get around that is they will say, well, there was this hierarchy in the church, and so you had brothers of the Lord, which were average Christians, and you had the apostles, the most important people, the, the leaders. And so the reason that Paul doesn't call Peter a brother is because Peter is an apostle and James is not. Uh, and that's why he, James, he's distinguishing between uh, Paul, I'm sorry, between Peter, the apostle, and James, not the apostle, just a normal brother. And that's how they get around that. But the issue with that is that later on in Galatians, it talks about the pillars of the church, you know, these leaders. And he says, Peter, James, and John. And it's like, well, so if, if James is a pillar of the church, is that not putting him at the same level of Peter, especially in 1 Corinthians 15, when it lists out all the people who've seen the Lord and people who've seen Jesus are apostles. They're the ones who are appointed. And he lists James in that list, you know, Peter, the 12, the 500, James and all the apostles. So he's, he's, equa he's equating James in that list. And so I think that would give reason to think, OK, James is an apostle and is level with Peter, in which case the mythicist rebuttal wouldn't really work at that point. You'd have to say, OK, James is called the brother because he literally is the brother. He's not just this cultic brother. And the this will get around that by saying, well, this is a different James. He's not talking about the James from Galatians 1. The James in uh, other Galatians passages is talking about a different James. But, you know, unless we have positive evidence to think Paul is distinguishing the two, I don't know why we should think that. And it is true that James, that in the Gospels talk about there being, you know, James, the brother of Jesus, and there's two disciples named James. Although the uh, the apostle James, according to at least Acts, was killed early on, and mythicists, mythicists typically don't even like to view the Acts or the Gospels as historical. So if we're going to throw those out and we can't use those, then we have no reason to think that there were multiple Jameses at that point, because Paul doesn't make a clear distinction. So, I yeah, I don't see that. Also, when Paul lists, I believe, uh, actually, let me double check real fast, because I don't want to say this and get it wrong. So let me check Galatians. Uh, great thing we can just look up a verse, right? Let's see, I think it's Galatians 2, yeah. Okay. He says, in fact, James, Peter, and John, who were known as pillars of the church. He says, James, P uh, yeah, James, Peter, and John. Yeah. So he does list them uh, uh, next to each other. So that's, um, that's significant. And it's also interesting because he says um, that he lists James and he lists, he says James, Peter, and John, because in the gospel, if this is talking about James, the son of Je Zebedee, James and John were brothers in the gospels, James, the apostle. So they are almost always listed together, James and John, because they were brothers. So the fact that he has James and then Peter and then John, I think implies this is not James, the son of Zebedee, who is the brother of John. It's James, the brother of Jesus. So the order, I think, is indicative there as well. So that's just what I want to, to point out with that. Um, yeah, I think that's in terms of the brother of Jesus. I think that's a pretty strong case. Did you have any thoughts on that? No, I, uh, I think uh, I think I agree. Um, I think we can uh, we can uh, conclude this um, with one more thing. I want to I want to I want to briefly discuss our views of the historical Jesus, and we can uh, head off. What do you think Jesus was teaching? What kind of person do you think he was? I think Jesus saw himself as a moral teacher and as a um, someone who was reforming kind of what was typically seen as the law. I think he was an apocalyptic prophet who talked about the kingdom of God being near. I think that he was probably a faith healer and exorcist where people thought that, you know, when he prayed for someone, they thought they were healed. And um, I think Jesus talked about himself being an agent of God, the Messiah, and people took him to to be some kind of God or at least some kind of important figure. And after his death, through whatever means they reinterpreted uh, Jesus being the fulfillment of the Old Testament. But I do think Jesus saw himself as the fulfillment. And I think Jesus went out of his way to try to reenact uh, figures like Moses or Elisha. And that was pretty common in the ancient world. I mean, like Alexander the Great tried to reenact the life of, um, uh, I think it was um, Achilles or Odysseus. I forget which one. I think it's Achilles. Um, and so I think Jesus saw himself as this figure and he tried to fulfill the Old Testament because he thought that was his duty. And the crucifixion kind of put a could have put a wrench in that. And the disciples weren't sure what to do with that. So, yeah, I would say that the historical Jesus was um, a Jewish teacher from Nazareth who was probably a faith healer who talked about the incoming and was an apocalyptic prophet, talked about the kingdom of God. 
and saw himself as some kind of prophet, some kind of fulfillment of the Old Testament and God's agent to bring about the end times. So that would be the, the briefest version I could probably give. I think I think his followers thought he was a prophet. Um, so I think we agree there. Mm -hmm. uh, I tend to lean towards more of a SGF brand than Robert Eisenman's. Oh, brand. the revolutionary Jesus, really? That's oh. interesting. Yes. And um, I don't think that contradicts Bart Ehrman's view either about an apocalyptic Jesus, because I can fall into the easily. Uh, that kind of molds into place very easily an apocalypticist revolutionary because uh in the first century ce we know that jewish rebels that were fighting against rome fought right. the apocalypse was coming so there's no contradiction there but yeah thanks for coming on caleb well thanks for having me, jacob this was fun and yeah i hope it was uh, informative to people who are watching and yep. maybe we can set something again so yep thanks guys appreciate it yep. and uh sign off Hello viewers, thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.